Hi, everybody. Working? My name is Paul Campbell, and I'm confused. I know that starts, it sounds like the start of a 12-step meeting, but I guarantee you we're not going down that road. I want to get local for just a second and thank St. George's School uh, for hosting this. The enormous amount of work that has gone into this, and Mark and the rest of the board, thank you. Joe Kennedy, the head of school and friend of mine, thank you, but mostly to Jamie Tender for all the incredible work he has done to bring us to this moment. I'm still confused, and the reason I'm confused is that I've worked for the International Baccalaureate Organization for almost 25 years. As a result, I've seen the number of programs go from 400 to 4,000. I've seen communities transformed. I've seen teaching transformed. Most importantly, I've seen hundreds of thousands of kids leave high school prepared to succeed in college, and more importantly, prepared to be compassionate citizens in our complex world. So I have walked on the sunny side of the educational street and looked across the street at the gathering gloom because every few months another report comes out that decries the state of public education in America, doomsayers that have good points about structure, some of those you will hear uh, through TED, some of those you will hear through newspaper headlines, some of them uh, have very dire titles like Tough Choices for Tough Times, The Gathering Storm, Surpassing Shanghai, and the granddaddy of them all, A Nation at Risk. The trouble is, while people agree that there's something wrong, they don't agree what to do about it. So the physicians have all basically diagnosed the same uh, disease, but they have come up with many different treatment plans, which is why I'm confused. Some would have us immerse ourselves in the classics. Some would lengthen the school day. Some would make school a year-round uh, undertaking. Some would focus solely on science, technology, engineering, and math. Some would get rid of 11th and 12th grade altogether graduate kids in 10th grade, and they could decide then whether they want to take up a vocation or go on to college. As a result, there's this food chain, this perfect food chain of blame. Employers get employees and they say, this person cannot read a technical manual. Or they get people who can read a technical manual and they say, this person is basically inarticulate and cannot communicate with their colleagues. Or they get somebody who has to work in a diverse work setting who doesn't have the skills to work in a diverse work setting. So they blame colleges. Colleges blame high schools. High schools blame middle schools. Middle schools blame elementary schools. Elementary schools blame nursery schools. And nursery schools blame the parents. And, you know, all that blame, all that rancor doesn't get us one inch closer to solving the fundamental problems. And I acknowledge that there are structural problems. I acknowledge that our system as it's set up today is antiquated, and what needs to change is structure and pedagogy. But there's still another thing that doesn't get talked about, and that's curriculum. So I am standing here today in defense of something I'll call the liberal arts. And I'm going to approach it from both a professional and a personal standpoint. Professionally, the IB may be the quintessential expression of the liberal arts education. A high school student, and St. George's students hopefully will be amongst this crew before too long, has to take basically college level work in all the disciplines. Their own language, a second language, a science, a math, a social science, and even an art. Uh, many of those are things that have been dismissed from the curriculum during the age of reform, but our feeling is that no education is complete without doing rigorous work in all those areas. In addition, the students have to write a 4,000 word research paper. They have to take a critical thinking class, and they have to participate in extracurricular activities with a focus on community service. This makes high school hard. This is where I tell my story. I don't like things that are hard. Um, I grew up gifted. 
severely gifted, I think is what I would have been called by my mother because I started reading at age three and I knew my times tables by the time I got to kindergarten. The only thing I couldn't do was tie my shoes. So I was a superstar and a bit of a pain to the teachers in Shaker Heights, Ohio. I was in a town that's renowned for its public education. Uh, people moved from all over the country to send their kids to this system. I got to second grade, and it's difficult at my age to admit that you peaked in second grade, but I, <laughs> I finished second grade in one month. They sat me in the hall. I, re I realize now this was not for me. This was for the other 20 kids in the class because I was probably dominating the class and maybe a little bit obnoxious, which reminds me of my daughter. As I say to my parents, much to their glee, I got exactly the child I deserved. But having finished second grade in a month, I just thought everything came easily. Then things started to get hard. When arithmetic became algebra, I didn't know how to cope. When science got serious, and it included math, I shied away. I was allowed to proceed through one of the best K-12 education systems in the state without taking that seriously. I was allowed to avoid learning a second language. I mean, it did take Latin, and it was useful that my teacher was alive during Caesar's Gallic Wars so she could report <laughs> firsthand what happened, but I was a horrible Latin student. And I was so scared of science and math because I was scared of things that were hard. Now, because I was verbal, because I was a self-identified humanist, because I could write, I could keep people at bay. I could keep them away when they wanted to do something, and I'm sure I would have resisted any real challenge, but what I needed is a structure that forced me to take all these things seriously. That's what I am lacking even today. That's why I feel so personally the commitment to the International Baccalaureate or any school that can make kids take all this stuff on and reach a certain level of proficiency, if not mastery, because they're gonna need all these things in college and they're gonna need them beyond college. So I think there's several obvious advantages. One is the marketplace. Now I'm not gonna show this slide for long because it's a little too tantalizing and this is the wrong reason to take on a broad-based liberal arts education, but we did a study of IB graduates from the US and we found that they were getting into elite universities at a much higher rate than the general applicant pool. That's why all those numbers are green on the right side. So colleges understand the value of a liberal arts education. The understanding is out there. It's just in high school. I worry when people worry about the fragile psyches of our adolescent sons and daughters. I would much rather have my daughter suffer in high school than in college, because in high school, small classes, guidance counselors, people who know her, support from home college, freshman classes of 900, dorms full of temptation, you have to be able to manage your own time, you have to have discipline, which she's not gonna get from me, I guarantee you. Um, <laughs> And it just seems a much safer environment to put kids through this crucible. And if they come through it, they may get into a better college, but that's not what's important. They're gonna have more choices in life. They're gonna have, I think, a better ability to solve problems. They're gonna be able to think critically because they'll have been taught to look at things from different perspectives. And this society is in desperate need of critical thinking. We're bombarded by information. If we can't distinguish fact from propaganda, if we can't understand when we're being manipulated, then we have a problem. That's a habit of mind. That's a skill. It has to be honed. It has to be tested. And I think it's probably more satisfying to finally get it in a subject that you're not comfortable with than it is to excel in one that comes easily to you. I did finally get around. My high school transcript is, it's really, it should be in a museum somewhere. I went to three years of high school. We had two semesters, seven courses a semester, so we had 42 grades. My first 21 grades, one A, and nothing else higher than a C. My last 21 grades, all A's. So I could turn it on when it was necessary to get to the next level, but I wasn't ready to succeed. I went off to a large Midwestern university in Ann Arbor, 
and they agreed after a semester that I perhaps was not the material for the University of Michigan. And they sent me a very firm note saying, why don't you take some time off? We're reconsidering our decision. And I did this happen to me twice. Along the way, I you know, got a factory job, I bought a motorcycle, I got a stereo. Life was good, but it took me a long time, and it still feel like I made the least of my educational opportunities. And if I made the least, coming from privilege, with opportunity, imagine what's happening to kids who don't have that opportunity. So I feel like their lives will be richer. Think about speaking a second language. It opens up, and I've seen this time and time again as I struggle with my infantile Spanish. When people speak a language of another culture, another country, they're invited in to places and to experiences that they would otherwise not have. We all know the data, we know how important this is, but from a very personal standpoint, I think it's something that we need to really think hard about. We need to insist I will be insisting, I will be the least popular person in my daughter's high school life. Because I'm going to insist that she at least try to take rigorous coursework in all the major disciplines. So, I muddle along. I think what saved me is two things. I love to read. I never stopped reading. I was one of those kids that would read the cereal box while I was eating the cereal. Anything that was printed or in front of me, whether it's on a screen or on a little screen or on a PowerPoint presentation or in a newspaper or in a book, I read and I absorb. And I also surround myself with smart people. But I still feel today that lack. I feel like I wish I understood science more. I wish that I didn't wait so long. By the time I finally took that science course, I loved it. But it was a lower level chemistry. It was safe. I didn't have to experience failure. I didn't have to do something that was hard. Um, so if you extrapolate that from my experience to all of our experiences, I think we're gonna be much better off if we stick to the basics. While we change everything, structure, while we change the way we deliver knowledge, we still have to insist that kids know a lot about a lot of things. This is not the age of specialization. This is the age of synthesis. This is the age where kids have to be able to look at a problem and understand it scientifically, be able to em em employ the logic of math, have a historical perspective, and they need to be able to explain it. They have to be literate, they have to be numerate, they have to be articulate, and they have to be open to perspectives from other cultures. So that's my simple message today. I think St. George's and many schools are on the right track. But as far as I'm concerned, this is something that we all need to take personally. Thank you.